As we continue 7.30 p.m. Thursday, February 2nd, 2022, excuse me, 2023, on this evening of Thursday, which agrees with the Hijri calendar where it is the 13th of Rajab, this blessed month of Rajab, inshallah. It was technically Masa al Jumu'ah, the evening of Friday, the year 1444, after the migration of our Prophet. Excuse me, everyone, for my tardiness because something was wrong with the system. I had to reboot it, start over again in order to uh, make it come on live. So, uh, my apologies for my tardiness today because, like I said, I was having some experiences, some technical difficulties with the machine. As we continue this great, tremendous book entitled Al Fatwa Al Hamawi Al Kubra by the great Imam Abu Abbas Taqi Din Ahmed Ibn Abd Al Hanim Ibn Abd Al Salam Ibn Taymiyyah Al Harwani Dimishki Rahimallah, the one who died 728 after the migration of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We stopped at the other upon the Qissa, or the story rather, of Abu Yusuf, who was the companion of Abu Hanifa. Rather, he was the one that serviced the Madhab al Hanafi. You'll find of how he was stern against the people of innovations and the people falsehood of those who deviated in creed, meaning who've deviated in foundations of belief, and how you'll find that those who are upon what was correct <coughs> and those who had true the jealousy for the religion of Islam. And for the creed of Al Aqidah to Sunni al Sarafiya, you'll find out how they were stern against the people of falsehood. From them, at that time, was a name or an individual named Bishop al Banisi. Until you'll find, as the story says, that he fled from Abu Yusuf al Qadi. Abu Yusuf, the one who serviced the Madhab Abu Hanifa, he was a judge. He was a judge. To the point where he heard the statements of Bishop al and he said, بِهَمْ Bring them to me. As it says in the statement, فَتَّهُوا إِلَيْهَمْ بِشْرٍ There was another individual that had accompanied Bishop al His name was Ali al-Ahwa. Ali al-Ahwa. But you'll find that at the end of the story, as we mentioned, that you'll find Bishop al Ali al-Ahwa was commanded to be in prison. As a re- as a result of them embracing the aqidah of the Jahmiyyah. And like we said, these affairs are not easy with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rather, you'll find that those who have jealousy for the proper belief, this is how they dealt with those who were influenced and uh, they were what? Influenced by falsehood. And their aqidah was tainted with false ideologies. And this is where you'll find how the Salaf had dealt with them. You'll find that it says, "Lama anka al-sifat wa azhar al-qawl al-jahm, qad zakarha ibn Abi Hatim wa ghayru." He said, "This is how they were dealt with in a manner that was stern, due to the fact that they had manifested the statement of Jahm al-Sufwan." So you'll find that those who want to die upon the pure Orthodox Islam, or the clear Islam with the proper ideologies, or excuse me, with the proper belief rather, excuse me with the proper belief that they are the ones who have jealousy for when they see or hear falsehood, especially the type of warped, perverted ideologies that Bishop Benisi was upon. And like we talked about last class, the Bishop Benisi, he was from those who used to make the dua, glory be to my Lord who is below, which is to let one know how the balala or the misguidance had penetrated his heart and to the point where he would even utter these type of erroneous statements and these hideous statements with Iyad Billah. But you'll find that Shaykh al-Islam Taymiyyah that he goes on to mention about another great scholar of our religion that I'm sure that someone 
or some of us are familiar with, and some of those who need to be introduced to this great alam. And he was the alam of Andalus. He was a scholar of Andalus. Andalus was Spain. Was Spain. Now, Spain, which is in Europe today. As we know, Spain used to be under the rule of the Muslims. It used to be under the rule of the Muslims. So Andalus, brothers and sisters, there was a scholar from Andalus that has a book in, in the Sunnah which some of us are familiar with, which we'll talk about right now. So Shaykh al Islam brought his statement of this great scholar from Andalus. So, like I said, the word Andalus was from the cities of Spain. The cities of Spain in Europe. And like we said, the country used to be under the rule of the Muslims. So when you hear the word Andalus, like we said, brothers and sisters, what should come to your mind is Spain. Spain. So this great scholar is from Andalus, technically Spain, from the past. Rahimallah. His name was Abu Abdullah, Muhammad ibn Abdullah ibn Abi Zamani. Ibn Abi Zamani. That was his name. The Shaykh of Islam brought his statement. Brought the statement and some of his points that was mentioned in a great book entitled Usul al Sunnah. Usul al Sunnah is a book that wasn't taught here, I don't think, as far as what I know. In America, it was not taught. Even though the book was checked by our Shaykh and my teacher and from my Mashaykh, who Alhamdulillah was able to spend some time with over in Medina. Shaykh Abdullah al Bukhari, Rahimullah, Hafibullah al Ahu, wa ta'ala Allah fi umrihi bin a'mal al Saliha. The great Imam of today, Shaykh Abdullah al Bukhari, checked this book called Usul al Sunnah by the great Imam Abu Abdullah, Muhammad ibn Abdullah ibn Abi Zamani, who was from the scholars of Andalus, and he settled in the, the city of Qurtuba. Qurtuba. Later on in his life, he, he settled in Qurtuba. Portuba is in the areas of Portugal. In the areas of Portugal. In those areas. All of those areas used to be under the rule of the Muslims. Used to be under the rule of the Muslims. Spain, Portugal. All those areas used to be under the rule of the Muslims. They used to rule it. <clears throat> so, you'll find that this great imam who was from Andalus, Rahimallah, and the imam al-Mashhur, Shaykh al-Islam says about him, he said, As we know, in the areas of Maghrib, which is in the west of the country of today, of Morocco, what we know, those areas were upon the madhab of Imam Malik. You'll find they were upon, upon from a lot of them, not all of them, a lot of them were upon the madhab of Imam Malik. Where you'll find that they considered from the Aimma al Malikiyah, al Malikiyah, meaning that they were upon the madhab of Imam Malik. From them, from those scholars of Maghrib, what was the great Imam Ibn Abdul Bar, Rahimallah, which is an important book that every student of knowledge should have in his library, which is called Tamheed or Istithkar. Istithkar or Tamheed. He was also from the scholars of Maghrib. Of Maghrib. His name was Ibn Abdul Bar. Ibn Abdul Bar. Ibn Abdul Bar. Also was upon the method of what? Al-Malik, Al-Malik, Al-Imam Malik. So you'll find that those scholars, usually, not all of them, but usually that were on that, that side of, of the lands, meaning towards Morocco, on that side. All the way when the Muslims used to rule Spain, when the Muslims used to rule Spain, and Portugal, and all those lands, they were usually upon the madhab of Imam Malik, where they were from the scholars of the Malikiyah. They were usually, not all of them, but, but the majority of them were upon the madhab of al Malikiyah. But this great alam in his book, and you'll find that Shaykh al-Islam is bringing the statements from that book, Usul al-Sunnah, by Ibn Abi Zamani. So, notice that Shaykh al-Islam respected this great alam, respected them. And this, this great alim, the scholar from Andalus, from Spain of today, died 399 after the Hijrah. 399 after the Hijrah, the great Imam Ibn Abi Zamani, of what Shaykh al-Islam will bring his statements. 
he'll bring his statement here. Bab al Imam al Arsh. And if you want these statements, the actual book is printed by by the great scholar of today, Sheikh Abdullah Bukhari, who checked it. And he also made ta'liq, he gave commentary on this book. He commented on it. And he also checked the narrations that are in it. In which, alhamdulillah, I was able to finish the book. I finished the book when I was in Kuwait. Usul al Sunnah by the great Imam Ibn Abi Zamani. This was about maybe eight years ago. We went to, I actually uh, learned this book, Usul al Sunnah by Ibn Abi Zamani. So, Shaykh al Islam is bringing or conveying his statement here. He says, the chapter of the belief, meaning from the belief of the Muslim, is to believe in the throne, the throne of Allah. The conviction or the belief of the Muslim believing in the existence of the Arsh, the existence of the throne of Allah. So, Shaykh al Islam conveys this Imam statement by saying, قَالَ وَمِنْ قَوْلِ أَهْلِ الصُّنَّةِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَزَّ وَجَلْ خَلَقَ الْعَرْشِ وَاخْتَصَّهُ بِالْعُلُوبِ وَالْإِرْتِفَاعِ فَوْقَ جَمِيعِ مَا خَلَقْ ثُمَّ اسْتَوَى عَلَيْهِ كَيْفَ شَاءْ كَمَا أَخْبَرَ عَنْ نَفْسِهِ فِي قَوْلِهِ تَعَالَى الرَّحْمَانُ عَلَى الْعَرْشِ اسْتَوَى وقوله تَعَالَى ثُمَّ اسْتَوَى عَلَى الْعَرْشِ يَعْلَمُ مَا يَلِجُ فِي الْأَرْضِ to the end of it. So, Shaykh al-Islam says, conveying the statement of Ibn Abi Zamani. He said, the belief of the Muslim of the existence of the throne of Allah. Qal, from the statement of those who tread or traverse the correct path in belief that indeed Allah created the throne. Khalaq al arsh And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala particularized it. By what? Being high or being above it. bil ulum Being above it. wal ibtifa Meaning ascending above it. And ascending above all of his creation, subhanahu. Thumma stawa alayhi, kayfa sha. And Allah created the heavens and the earth and everything that is between it within six days. Then he what? Ascended above it, however he will, subhanahu. In a manner that befits him. And it does not resemble the ascension of the creation. It does not resemble the ascension of the creation. Kama akhbara an nafsihi fi qawla. Just as Allah has informed about Himself or concerning Himself, concerning Himself in His statement in His book, Ar Rahman ala al Arsh istawa, the Most Merciful above the throne ascended. The Most Merciful above the throne ascended. In the statement of Allah, Thumma istawa ila al Sama, Thumma istawa ala al Arsh, that Allah, after He created the heavens and the earth and that which is between it within six days, then. He ascended above the Arsh. The word then, everyone, what does that necessitate? Time. That there was a point in time that Allah, by His infinite wisdom, ascended above the throne. So it's an act that Allah did, and in a manner He did it, and at a time that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did it. And you'll find that the details of the time comes in the ayah, where it says, He created it within what? And everything that was in the heavens and the earth within what? Six days. The ayats and the verses are clear. Six days. Sittata ayyam. Thumma. Six days then. What does that come to one's mind? Time. There was a time frame. There was a time frame. And a time when Allah did the act. Of, of what? Istiwa. Which is of ascension. Which is what we call sifatu fi'ah. The act, the characteristic of an act, action that Allah does. When he wills to do it, subhanahu. Is it clear, everyone? Fine, so let's keep going. You'll find that Ibn Abi Zamani, the Shaykh al Islam, continues to convey the statement in his book, Usul al Sunnah. He says, فَسُبْحَانَ مَنْ بَعُدَ وَقَدُ بِعِلْمِهِ He said, Glory be to the one of who is far and near by his knowledge. We'll explain the statement because it needs to be clarified. And you'll find that the great Imam Muhammad al Jami said, that those type of statements we have to give more what clarity and if he would have brought it in another way it would have been more befitting we'll talk about that in a minute فَسَمِعَ النَّجْوَى and he hears the secret gatherings he said that Allah hears the secret gatherings of people وَذَكَرَ حَدِيثَ أَبِي رَزِينَ الْعُقَيْنِ قُلْتُ يَا رَسْلَ اللَّهِ أَيْنَمَا كَانَ رَبُّنَا قَبْلَ أَنْ يَخْلُقْ 
قال أن يخلق السماوات والأرض قال في عماء ما تحته هواء وما فوقه هواء ثم خلق عرشه عن الماء تنامر So glory be to the one who is far and near by his knowledge. Glory be to the one who is far and near by his knowledge. We'll clarify the statement because it needs to be clarified. And the one who hears the secret gatherings or the secluded gatherings. Then Yofan ibn Abi Zamani, this great imam from, from Andalus, from Spain of today. The hadith of Abu Razin al-Uqaymi. He mentioned the hadith of Abu Razin al-Ruqayni and he said, O Messenger of Allah, where was our Lord before he created the heavens and the earth? He says, Fi ama, in a type of clouds which is not under it, any air or any or above it, any air or air above it. We'll explain this narration whether it's authentic or not. Then he created the throne above the water. Then he created the throne above water. The great Imam Muhammad ibn Abi Zamani or Muhammad ibn Abdullah, Abu Abdullah ibn Abi Zamani, he explained this statement by the word Al Ama. Allah was in, Allah was above Ama. Above Ama. Al Ama here means clouds, thick, thick clouds. Fima Zakarahu Al Khalil. Al Khalil, who will explain who he is from the great scholars of Arabic, his name was Al Khalil. That was from the scholars of the past of the Arabic language. Then he mentioned other narrations. So, let's explain these, what we just read. Fine. The great Imam Abu Abdullah, Muhammad, ibn, Muhammad ibn Abdullah ibn Abi Zamani, the great Imam, like we said, from the Aimma of Al-Imam Malik, which is a book entitled Usul al-Sunnah. And like I said, as far as what I know, I don't think that this book was taught here in America, as far as what I know. That someone knows, someone that's taught the book, but it was a book that has never been taught from a scholar from, from Spain in which you'll find that Shaykh al-Islam conveys his statement from his book called Usul al-Sunnah. And like we said, the book is checked. It's checked by our Shaykh Abdullah al-Bukhari, Hafidullah. طيب. He goes on to say, قَالَ وَمِنْ قَوْلِ أَهْلِ الصُّنَّةِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ جَلُوا عَزْ خَلَقَ الْعَرْشِ وَاخْتَصَّهُ بِالْعُلُوْ وَالْإِرْتِفَاعِ فَقَ جَمِيعِ مَا خَلَقَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala particularized the throne with the act of, of istiwa, of ascending above it, as we just mentioned a moment ago. But, like we spoke about on many occasions and in many classes, the characteristic of istiwa, which is the ascension of Allah, is connected with Allah's will. Meaning Allah does it when He wills, how He wills, when He wills, how he wills, and if he wills. It's a characteristic of Allah's actions, which is called sifatu fi'liya. The characteristic of an act, or an act that Allah does when he wills, how he wills, if he wills. Is it clear, everyone? At the same time, that characteristic is khabariya. Khabariya. And that we mentioned in other classes is khabariya or sam'iya or naqliya. All of them are synonyms, meaning that they mean the same, same thing. All of them are synonyms. Khabariya, sam'iya, naqliya. What does that mean? This characteristic of the ascension of Allah is fi'liya khabariya. It's a characteristic that Allah, a characteristic of the action of Allah, and it was khabariya, meaning. It was purely conveyed through revelation. Purely conveyed through revelation. That we would not have known that Allah has this characteristic unless what? Allah informed us about it. That He created the heavens and the earth in six days. There's no way for the mind or the intellect to attain this type of what? Knowledge. Only purely through what, everyone? Through revelation. We have not have known that Allah created the heavens and the earth within six days, then by his infinite wisdom, particularize the throne with istiwa, with, ascend, with ascending above it. And just because, as we said, just because Allah is above it, which is the consensus, what the Muslims believe, Allah does not need the throne. Allah does not need anything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the characteristic of ghina, ghina dhati, absolute self-sufficiency and free of anything. 
which is ghali or ghina. Allah is ghali. That's the characteristic of his essence. Meaning, Allah is always not in need of anything. Is it clear, everyone? Allah is always not in need of anything, especially, especially to put emphasis on the creation. Allah does not need the throne. He does not need the angels. He does not need anything. That is an ijma'. First, that's from the kitab, the book of Allah, where Allah describes himself as being ghali. And the authentic sunnah, the narrations of the message of Allah, informing that, the, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also a ghali. And the consensus of Ahl Sunnah, Qatima, and the, and the prophets and the messengers before, all of them believed that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is free of anything, meaning He is not in need of anything. And Allah is not in need of the throne. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above it. And we do not say the, the statements of the people, the Jahmiyyah, to cause doubt, which is that Allah sits. We do not say that. We say, just as Allah said in His book and the authentic Sunnah, that He's above it. That's it. And we stop there. No more, no less. We mentioned the, the wording in which Allah has brought in His, in his book, in His perfect book, the Kitab al Aziz, the Quran in which we read. And that we stick to that wording and we do not what? Go outside of that. Allah is above it and that Allah ta'ala at the same time is not in need of it. Is it clear? Jayyid. As we said, this characteristic of, of istiwa, of ascension, as we said, that Allah subhanahu informed us through revelation in which this is called khabari. Khabariya if you want to call it, or sam'iya, or naqliya. Meaning this characteristic of Allah is a characteristic of Allah's action, fi'liya, and it's a characteristic that was conveyed through revelation, which means what? Khabariya. Is it clear, everyone? Meaning that this affair, or this particular characteristic of Allah, it is not for the aql, not for the rationale, or the intellect, or the mind, to affirm this characteristic. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had not informed us about it, no one should have the gall or the nerve to now describe Allah about an affair that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not inform us of. Meaning, this affair purely revolves around what everyone? Revelation. And it's not for anyone to bring any characteristic as it pertains to our Lord from how they feel or from their rationale or their mind or their intellect. Is it clear, everyone? If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if He did not inform us, inform us about this, we would be quiet. But Allah did inform us that He created the heavens and the earth and what was between it within six days. Then, subhanahu, He particularized the throne to ascend above it. And like we mentioned a moment ago, just because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ascended above the throne does not mean what? That He needs it. Nor do we say that Allah sits like the creation. That's the reason why the, those who negated it negated this characteristic because they resemble Allah with the creation and then the second step was what? They negated it. Because for some odd reason in their mind they think just because something is above the throne based upon what they've seen of the creation that's how Allah is. That's not the case. There's things that Allah has created that is above us and it does not need to recline on anything for it to be constantly above us. Those are in things that Allah created. What about Allah Himself? There are things from the creation that Allah has created where it could be constantly above us and it does not need to what? Sit on anything or recline on anything. That's in the affairs that Allah created. What about Allah Himself? And He is the perfect of those who are free of anything and not in need of anything. Is it clear, everyone? Jay. So you'll find, as we mentioned, Ibn Abi Zamanin in his Usul al Sunnah, Ibn Abi Zamanin, he goes on to say, Kama akhbara an nafsihi fi qawdihi ar Rahman ala al Arsh istawa. Then you'll find that he brings his evidence from the Book of Allah. And the two ayat, when it comes to Surah Al Taha, ayat number five, and Surah Al Hadid, ayat number four. The most merciful above the throne ascended. Then he brings the second ayat, Surah Al Hadid, ayat number four. 
Then he ascended above the throne. He knows of what penetrates the earth and what, com- what comes out of it. To the end of the ayah. So now let's go to the statement that you'll find that the great Imam Muhammad Ibn Jami had to clarify and critique it a little bit. He said, Glory be to the one who's far and near by his knowledge. This word ba'ud, being far. He says, if he would have brought another statement to clarify the statement, it would have been more befitting. He says, you'll find that we always, in every occasion, we mention the qa'idah, the principle that Shaykh al-Islam tells us to cling to. What is it? Iltizam al-alfaad al-shari'ah al-walidah fi kitab wa sunnah. It is befitting that one cling to the legislated statements that have been narrated in the Book of Allah and in the Sunnah, of the Message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Such as what everyone? Such as that Allah is above. Or if one can say this, such as I'm about to give the clarity now. فَسُبْحَانَ الْعَلِي فِي قُرْبِهِ وَالْقَرِيبِ فِي عُلُوِّهِ He said that's more befitting to say. Glory be to the one, the most high, the most high, that he is what? The most high in his nearness, and he is near in his what? In his highness. Is it clear what I'm saying, everyone? Glory be the most high in his nearness. Meaning just because Allah is above, his knowledge is what? Everywhere. Which necessitates he is close by his knowledge. Is it clear, everyone? Because Allah knows He has knowledge of what's in our bodies, what's taking place right now. But we don't know even about ourselves. If that's not closeness, then what is? Even though at the same time He's what? Above the creation. Is it clear, everyone? So that's what He means by the statement when He says, فَسُبْحَانَ الْعَلِي فِي قُرْبِهِ وَالْقَرِيبُ فِي عُلُوهِ لَكَانَ أَوْلَى Glory be to the one, the most high in His nearness, as far as in His knowledge. And closeness in His highness. Meaning, Allah is close by his knowledge, even though he's still what? Above us. Is it clear? Jay. He said, if he would have said this, Ibn Abi Zamanin, rahimahullah, that would have been more befitting. That would have been more befitting. Like an awla. Iltizam lil alfaad al shari'ya bi alfaadiha. Wa in kana al ma'na al ladi yudeed huwa hadha. He said, clinging to the legislated wordings by utilizing those words, even though. The meaning of what he intended, this is, this is it here. This is what he mean, meant to say, of course. فَكَلَامُهُ مُؤَدَّاهُ هَلْ كَلَامُ مَعْنَ هَلْ كَلَامُ He said, of course, it end up of what he just said is what we just, what, what we just expressed, or what we just put in this place. That would have been more befitting. He said, it is always binding. It is more befitting to cling to those words that come in the book of Allah in the Sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam. Like we said, everyone, you'll find that Muhammad, Sheikh Muhammad Ahmad Jami, when he criticized certain books in the past, that he said the words that the people of innovations use that caused doubt in the heart of the Muslim concerning their Lord was, was utilizing these type of words, such as the word place. The word place, as it pertains to Allah, that it should not be used in its origin at all. You just stick to what Allah has mentioned in his book and you'll be safe. You'll stick to the authentic sunnah what the Prophet ﷺ said, and you'll be safe. You will not find, fall into a what? Words that necessitated what? Confusion and doubt, such as the word place. The word, for example, this is just an example, it's not just restricted to this word, there's other words, but this is one of them. The word place can, can what? Carry a true meaning and a false meaning, as we just said last class. It can what? Necessitate a false what? Meaning and a what? And a true meaning. So if the person used it, then, it's, then we have to now what? Investigate. What meaning are you speaking about? What do you mean? What do you intend by this word? Another word, for example, jihad, direction. Direction. Those words, like we said in its origin, they were they were brought by, they were brought by the people of innovation in order to cast doubt in the heart of the Muslim in order to cause confusion. They tried to bring these words 
But the Salaf, like we said, in certain instances had to combat it with certain words because they became forced to. However, in its origin, they stick to what Allah mentioned in his book and they did not go outside of that. And that was the asl, the origin that they what? Had clung to, had, that they had to cling to in order to be upon the correct aqidah. Type. so let's keep going. طيب وذكر حديث أبي رزين العقيلي قلت يا رسول الله أين كان ربنا قبل أن يخلق السماوات والأرض The hadith of Abu Razin al-Uqayli He asked on message of Allah Where was our Lord before He created the heavens and the earth? He said في عمائن He said high above the clouds That there was not under it air or above it air Then He created the throne above water As Muhammad Ibn Abdullah, the great Imam, Ibn Abi, Raz, Ibn Abi Zamani, he said, As-Sahab al-Kathif al-Mutbiq, explaining the word al-Ama. What does it mean? He said, those thick uh, type of what? Clouds. Of what the great Imam of Lugha named Al-Khalil mentioned. So, what do we say about the authenticity of this particular hadith? Thumma qala, هذا الحديث ضعيف. As this narration is what? Weak. آفته وكيع ابن حدس وعدس Not the great Imam وكيع ابن جراح الرؤاسي الكوفي Not the great Imam This is another individual named وكيع وكيع ابن حدس وقيل ابن عدس They say the great Imam الذهبي مجهول لا يعرف He's not known who he is The great Imam ابن قتيبة الدينوري Has said in his book called تأويل مختلف الحديث the exact same thing. That this narrator Wakir ibn Hadis is not known. In addition to that, the great Imam al Dhahabi said the exact same thing. وَتَابَعَهُمَا The great Imam of today, Muhammad Nasr al-Din al-Albani, rahimahullah, said the same thing, given more details in this regard. بَيَنَ وَجْهَ كَوْنِهِ مَجْهُولًا He said that he what? Clarified the reason of why this individual was considered not known. So hence, the hadith, what everyone, is it clear? So this hadith, it cannot be utilized even in the affairs of fiqh, of jurisprudence. He says, besides that it could be utilized in affairs as pertaining to what? Revelation and foundation and what? In belief. The, the affairs of the sifat of Allah and all of the affairs of what they call al-matalib al-ilahiyya. The deified affairs, meaning the affairs that's pertaining to what? The deitized affairs, meaning the affairs that's pertaining to Allah. These type of narrations cannot be used, nor relied upon. He said, for that reason, we do not rely on these narrations and we turn away from it. For it to be utilized in affairs that's connected with what? The foundations in our religion and the affairs or what they call the deified affairs or the deitized affairs, meaning the affairs that's connected with Allah. These are the most sacred of all matters. So the matter of what we rely on in this type of perspective has nothing to do with anything that is weak. The evidence for affirming the aboveness or highness of Allah, there are a lot of evidences. A lot of evidences that Allah is what? Above the creation. In the book of Allah, in the authentic sunnah of the message of Allah, and the characteristic of loftiness or highness or aboveness, just as it's preceded, is a characteristic of Allah's essence. And at the same time, it can be affirmed by the intellect, even though that's not the foundation. It's a sifatun dhatiyatun aqliya, meaning it's a characteristic of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's essence, and it can it can be affirmed by the intellect, even though that's not the foundation. Is it clear? Meaning, I'm going to give some more clarification now. It's been affirmed by the book of Allah, the Sunnah of the Prophet, the consensus of the Sahaba, and the what? Al Aql al Salim. Meaning, the intellect that has not been tainted by Greek philosophy. <laughs> Nor the natural disposition 
that has been altered and changed by the human being. So it's been affirmed by all of these affairs. The Book of Allah, the Sunnah of the Prophet, the consensus of the Sahaba, and the what? The pure mind that submits to revelation and the natural disposition of the human being that has not been changed nor altered. Affirms what everyone? Allah's aboveness and highness above the creation. If they have not been what? Tainted or influenced by the evil outside influences of this world and from them is what everyone? Greek philosophy. If Greek philosophy has not distorted the mind of the individual, he would naturally affirm Allah's above him. Meaning, if, if the human being was in an island or a far, or far uh, remote land and he was left there and the shaitan did not alter his what? His belief by some type of influence. Whether, no matter what it is. Whether it be by the fire worshippers or by all types of belief of polytheism or superstitions or by the technology from the internet to the likes. If he was left and all these factors were what? Removed. And he developed alone, he would naturally he'd be inclined towards affirming the what? The existence of Allah and that Allah deserves to be worshipped. And he would direct his worship to, to the one above him. So this affair of Allah being above has been established by all of these affairs. The book of Allah, the son of the message of Allah, the consensus of the Sahaba, and al-aql as the pure, uh, untainted uh, rationale or mind of human being, and his natural inclination. وَلَمْ يُخَالَفْ فِي إِثْبَاتِ صِفَةِ الْعُلُوْ إِلَّا بَعْتُ مُبْتَدِعَةِ الْجَهْمِيَةِ No one went against the affirmation of Allah being above except those who are evil from people of innovation who traverse the path of the Jahmiyyah and who follow them. For that reason, like we said, this affair of Allah being above, what they call the characteristic of ulu, is a consensus. Consensus of who, everyone? The consensus of the companions of the Messenger of Allah and the Tabi'een. The best ijma', the best consensus, everyone, and I want everyone to hear this, is the consensus of the Sahaba. Ijma'u Sahaba. Just as we mentioned, probably a couple of lessons, maybe a month ago, approximately, the narration of the great Imam of Sham, Abdul Rahman ibn Amr al-Awza'i, Imam Ahl al-Sham, that he said, أَنَّهُمْ كَانُوا وَالْتَابِعُونَ مُتَوَافِرُونَ أي هو من تابع التابعين, the great Imam of Sham, meaning the place of what we know currently of Syria and Jordan and Palestine. All those areas are called Sham. That great imam at that time, his name was Abdul Rahman ibn Amr al Awza'i. He said, and that statement we already covered, he says, We and the Tabi'un were abundance in number. He was from the Tabi'i Tabi'i. You'll find that the Imam al Awza'i was from those who followed the Tabi'i. Notice he said, Kunna wa Tabi'un mutawafirun. He said, We and those who followed the companions were what? In abundance. And I followed the Tabi'un, meaning the Imam al-Awza'i. He said, we used to say, indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above the throne. And we believe firmly in what has come in the authentic narrations of the Prophet sallallahu of those characteristics. And for that reason we said, we do not need, similar to this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu anything weak of affirming the aboveness of Allah nor in affirming his ascension. But why is it that a narration is mentioned of weakness? This we'll discuss in the next class, inshallah. Why did the great Imam Ibn Abi Zamani brought this narration that has weakness in it in order to affirm the buddhness of Allah? That is something we'll discuss in the next class. And I'll discuss that in detail, even though I've already mentioned it maybe uh, somewhat a couple of years ago. But there's no problem that we reiterate of why the ulama of the past that they used to bring uh, a weak, particular weak narration and these type of affairs within their books uh, even though the authentic ones were relied upon. We'll mention that in the next class, inshallah. We'll stop here. Any questions about the lesson? So keep in mind, like we said, the scholars of the past from them is Ibn Abi Zamani in the book Usul al-Sunnah by Abu Abdullah, Muhammad bin Abdullah Ibn Abi Zamani is still present. Like I said, the great Imam of today, Sheikh Abdullah al-Bukhari, check the book, it's available. I have it in my, in my house, I have two copies. 
And like I said, alhamdulillah, I was able to study the book and finish it and complete it when I was in Kuwait. About, about nine years ago, ten years ago, we completed it. We went through it and finished it. It's a tremendous book and it also uh, gives us some type of acknowledgement that there were scholars in Spain. And before it was called Spain, it was Andalus. It was Andalus. And those type of affairs, like we said, the Muslims need to realize in order to know how great the Muslims were in the countries that were under their rulership at that time. People think it's always the Middle East. No, is it isn't. Islam spread from the Middle East to the corners of China, all the way up to Europe, to the point where they reached what? France. It almost took over the whole world. And that's what the what? The non-Muslims were afraid of, and this is what they're afraid of to today, that it could happen again. So what to do to keep the Muslims weak is to either what? Destroy them in their belief, or, or keep them up falling into major sins. And those are the things that's holding the Muslims back. Is them being divided in creed or falling into major sins. Those type of affairs render them extremely what? Weak. Keep them divided. Keep them divided by different types of aqaid, different types of corrupt beliefs and ideologies. And in, in addition to that, what? Have them tempted to commit major sins. And to the point where you see a lot of Muslims openly commit major sins. Openly, with no shyness. And this is the things, these are the reasons why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is removing some of these blessings that we have today. You see that a lot of the blessings that we have are being removed. A lot of them. From them is knowledge, from them is the people having enthusiasm to learn, and from them other affairs that we used to have that the people had within themselves, and those type of affairs are being what? Removed due to the open displayment and public publicizing of major sins without any shame. And as a result of it, people think that Allah is going to bless us if we're open major sinners. It's not going to happen. If we're open major sinners, rather the only thing that Allah knows best that's keeping Allah from throwing or casting upon us a major punishment is someone that continues to speak out against it. Because once everyone now is silent, even the religious leaders are silent, Allah is going to throw, cast us into all punishment and envelop all of us. So we need to praise Allah that there is some people still out there, what? Speaking against these affairs. Because once everyone's silent, that's it. The Prophet said, once everyone is silent, and it's as if they're condoning it, that's when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's punishment will envelop everyone. So we need to what? Be thankful that there's still people of the Sunnah that speak out against these matters, and they command the good, and they forbade the evil, and they don't condone these acts, and they stand firm in the face of adversity, even though the people don't like it, not realizing it's, it's good for them, and it could be the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not thrown a major punishment down upon us. With the billah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve us and preserve you. We'll stop here, inshaAllah. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Subhanakallahu wa bihamdak. Wa shalom la ilaha illa ant. Astaghrika wa tubi.